The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're glad that you're here. If you're joining us here in person or joining us through the internet on Facebook Live, we welcome you. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your life experience might be, you're safe and welcome among us in Jesus' name. A few announcements before we begin worship. Most of those you're going to find on the weekly update. Uh, you can find that online on the Facebook or in person in your hands, right? As much as I want to deny it, September starts soon, like this week, right? So the, the main uh, announcements are about September 11th, and that's rally day. That's when a lot of things kick off. So we have adult class will start, Sunday school for young people will start. We're going to do a rally day with a bake sale and a lot of other things. And we're also going to do a backpack and workbook or work bag blessing. So if you haven't been to school for a while but you still carry something to work, that's okay. Bring that. We're going to bless them and we're going to have uh, bag tags that say something about uh, that were just a reminder that wherever you work, whether it's at school or, or somewhere else, uh, you are being thought of and prayed with the community here that surrounds ourselves in Jesus. Um, the other things are there. One thing I do want to announce that's not in here is that the, you'll notice that there's been a change in the front office. So after many, many years, we've had Teresa Easterly join us, and for the last two years, she's been telecommuting uh, from her place in Atlanta. That worked well during the during the pandemic, when we were all shut down anyway, but we realized it needed to be a change, so we have brought on two new people uh, to fill one job. So they're splitting their time, and uh, so we have Cher Cher Virginia Mueller, let's start with that one, <laughs> and Sarah Schumacher. And uh, so Sarah's got the afternoon shift. She comes in at 12 to 4, and Virginia goes from 8.30 to 12.30, yes. So the, the office is covered from 8.30 to 4, five days a week. And uh, so welcome to Sarah and Virginia. They had their first, they got things printed this week, and uh, they're, they're going. So they're, not, they're still in the training stage, but they're, um, they're almost completely on their own. So welcome. With that... We begin to worship.
I invite us to stand and turn to face the font in the back. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way instead of putting others before ourselves. We long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often pressed on the other side. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Beloved of God, hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. We are free to love as God loves. Our opening hymn is All Who Hunger Gather Gladly. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. and defend us. 
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you resist those who are proud and give grace to those who are humble. Give us the humility of your Son that we may embody the generosity of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. And anybody that wants to come up and join Wolfgang and myself is welcome to do so. talking about? I'm number 11. Woo, woo. Okay. Why are you number 11? Well, don't you all have numbers? Um, no. We have phone numbers. Well, not that. I'm number 11. I, well, I think we got that part. So where did you get this idea about numbers? Well, out in the woods, there was Farah, and she was saying, I'm number one. <laughs> okay. Well, and I thought everyone has to have a number. Because she's like, I'm number one. <laughs> we got that part. Okay. So we talked to other of the other animals, and they all said they were more important than I was. So I figured out that I was number 11. So I'm number 11. Woo! Okay, I don't know if that works that way, does it? Do we have numbers? Is somebody like the number one person? No, that's not how this works. What? Well, how does it work? Well, Jesus is talking about that today. It's always Jesus. <laughs> always Jesus. And Jesus is talking about people who think they're number one. They're more important than than somebody else. Is anybody else more important than another person? No. Even the president or a king or a queen, they're not, they may have an office that's more important, but they're not more important as a person. Really? Yes. So, I'm not 11? You can be 11 if you want, but that's not how important you are. Jesus says we're all number one. Not be. How can we have all people be elevens or ones? I get confused. Maybe you get confused. I get confused. How can we all be number one? How can we all be number one? Do you know? Well, Jesus says, I love everybody the same. So that means rich or poor, whatever color we are, wherever we live, Whatever language we speak, even wolves, even wolves, uh, wolves, um, they're all loved the same. So that makes us number one to Jesus, right? Right? Ah, that does make sense. I'm number one. That's true. Who else is number one? You are number one. That's true. You're number one. Okay. I think we got it. It's okay. So, we're all number one for Jesus. Okay. Thank you for coming up and helping me with this. Thank you. And good. Good and Morgan. Good and bye. <laughs> Arvita Sam. A reading from the book of Proverbs. Do not put yourself in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. 
God. As our response to the reading from Proverbs, we will read Psalm 112 responsibly. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor. Word of God, word of life. Our second reading is from the book of Hebrews. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them, those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Who can, do, who can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who sp spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Invite us to stand for the reading of Jesus' words from the Gospel. Gospel according to Luke, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. On one occasion, Jesus, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose places of honor, he told them a parable. When you were invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit up at a place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And then the host invited you both may come to you and say, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, Move up higher, and then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then he also said to the one who invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case in case 
they may invite you in return, and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. I want to give some credit to, uh, I think it's Professor David Lose now. Uh, he was pastor when he wrote this. But anyway, so, so some turns of phrases and things I'm going to quote from him. So I'm just giving you a fair warning. I'm footnoting here. So if there's any sermon or any teaching or any event that also guaranteed that Jesus was going to be killed, it was this one. Now that might seem kind of shocking because this seems really bland. This seems like Jesus is at most being kind of a righteous mismanners. It's a good idea to sit at the back so that, I mean, it just makes sense, it's especially after what we just read in the Proverbs. I mean, it just sounds like a proverb that the story expanded. And Jesus is just giving good advice. It doesn't seem to really have much meat to it. For the preacher, for the listener, and that's partly because we don't understand the, the rumbling that would have gone on after this. Jesus has been disturbing the Pharisees now. We just saw that last week as he healed, he dared to heal this daughter of Abraham on the Sabbath. And he's starting to upset the cart quite a bit challenging the system, the authorities, the way it always is and everyone knows it should be. Jesus is picking at that. Maybe not picking. Maybe he's punching at that. Maybe not punching, but he's shoving at that because he's not being subtle at all. This is messed up the way you do things. And he's starting to get on their nerves. Maybe not so much on their nerves. He's starting to get them very irritated. Maybe not so much that as that they're thinking already of how they can get rid of him. This man is a danger to everything in their world. Not just religiously, although that's part of it, a major part of it, but politically, socially, this man seems to be pushing down walls that were very, very sacred. At least to them. This is the way the world works, Carpenter. This is the way things are. And who are you from Galilee to tell us Judeans, these sophisticated people, how things work? But Jesus seems a little unaware or uncaring, might be a better term, or at least caring in a different way about these people, because they are bound. We sometimes see Jesus as being angry and upset at the Pharisees, but he's not. He's upset and, and angry at the system that has them just as enchained as those who are poor and lame and crippled. They don't see it because their world relatively is pretty good. So they think. But it doesn't take much for Jesus to push for them to see that the world is really on a razor's edge. And it isn't that good. It isn't that secure. It is really a pressure that they can't sustain. And that they really know it inside. 
that Jesus wants them to see how imprisoned they are by these walls. The culture into which Jesus comes is, as you've heard me say many, many times, is, but it's very important to understand how we interpret the New Testament, is an honor-shame culture. Everything is bound in that. Honor-shame. You're on one side or the other. And when we get to Paul, which I'm going to reference later, it's also the same. The Greco-Roman world is the same it's a bound system. Everyone knows, like Wolfgang, what number they are. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog society in Palestine and in Corinth. It is dog-eat-dog, -dog, and every day you try to push yourself higher up the pyramid. It's a pressure. And this idea of being invited and being put at the closer to the table, closer to the, the head table, is important. Because that means that you have honor and that you are doing well. It's like a, 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 it's like a sports team that's in, you know, in your brackets. And as they lose, they go down. When they go up. Every citizen of this world understood that. But especially those who had time to think about it. Like the Pharisees. Who were wealthy just enough to know they were what we would be called middle class. So they're, they're not inherited wealth. They're working wealth. They're, they're holding on to this by just a grasp. And so if you're going down, that's not a good thing. That means the shame is coming into you and your family. And it means that God is somehow frowning upon you. And that your worth is not as good as the person that's sitting two, two uh, seats ahead of you. This is where they're at. And so... Jesus wants to look at them, and he tells them this parable, which is really kind of a hyperbolic way of saying things. It's kind of not a parable, but a way of pushing the envelope for them to show them how foolish this system is. That we're all jockeying to find who's better than the other person. And there's winners, very few. Most people are losers. And we're not even talking about the poor, the crippled, and the lame. So when Jesus says, hey, how about you don't invite your friends to the next banquet? Because you're already getting the echo chamber that you want. You're showing yourselves and you're mostly your friends that you were part of the honor code and honor part of, his, of, of the society when you have the money to do such lavish things. I don't know if they had double mortgages in Jesus' day, but I'm sure they would. Just to show your neighbors, ah, I'm, I made it. God loves me. And I'm going to show it off by inviting you here. Jesus said, you've already got your reward because that's just re-echoing the things you already think. And it's false. There's no number system. It's something you all made up. And it's killing you. But it's also killing your neighbors. Look outside the door. Look outside the door to the 60 to 80% of the community in Jesus' day that's out there that's the poor. The, what you call the sinners, because they're too poor to keep all the commandments. The crippled and the lame, we all know that they're not in God's favor. We all know that they're there for a reason. 
right? No. Jesus said, you want to be a, a real big wig? Invite those people. Because they can't pay you back. When I did my dissertation on 2 Corinthians, this is what I focused on, because Paul is fighting the same battle in Corinth about the rich people and the poor people, the slaves and their owners who are part of the same community. And they're trying to figure out who's better and who's worse, and they're starting to look at Paul because there's a new, new preachers in town that seem fancier than Paul. And Paul keeps bringing them back to the cross. What? Do we follow a glorified Jesus, a crucified Jesus? How did Jesus, as God incarnate, identify with humanity? By brokenness and death. As a way to say, I understand. When life is broken and hurting, I understand. When you're in grief, and your pain. I understand when you're the ones not even invited to the table, let alone at the bottom. Because, sisters and brothers, siblings in Christ, that's where we all are. We set up these factories of self-identification, but God says, no, that's not how I see you. So what I said in my dissertation is that Jesus, Paul is trying to figure out what I call a new creation community. A new creation community of Gentiles and Jews and women and men and poor and rich. And he said, this under the cross, this is what the Christian church should be. This new stripping away of all this honor, shame stuff. Because in Jesus, the shame has been taken away. And it's not cultural honor, it's God's honor. Whether you're lying in a ditch somewhere or here at the top of the table, Jesus sees you the same and loves you the same. Sees the chains, whether they're golden chains or rusted chains. Jesus sees the chains and wants to liberate that. That's Jesus' word here to these rich men who can't see past themselves. I love this quote from Hebrews in our reading today. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. This, remember, this is a sermon written to people who are being persecuted, who are being beat up. Don't neglect going to the tortured and the prisoners. Because they're God, they're not in shame. But God is with them too. Don't reflect on the way your leaders or what their life is turning out. Many of their leaders are being imprisoned and tortured and killed at this time. Because there's where the love of God works. Every human being we encounter, whether they make us upset or not, whether they make us revolt or not, whether we understand them or not, is an angel unaware. Because in Christ, the chains have been taken off. The walls have been pushed down. And the love has come in. Now in Jesus' day, that was too much. That was too much for them to bear. And they dealt with him. But the invitation for us who follow the crucified one is to continue to remember, to follow, to be renewed through the waters of baptism, through the meal at the table, through the preaching of the word, to hear again, you are free. Thanks be to God. We sing as we gather at your table.
With the whole church, let us profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. For the church and its leaders, we pray. Uphold all deacons, pastors, and bishops who serve and teach your people. Awaken in your church a spirit of invitation that reaches ever outward. Merciful God, for the well-being of creation and its inhabitants, we pray. Stir in us relevant awe for the beauty of the natural world, for oceans and lakes, rivers and streams, forests and deserts. Merciful God, for the nations and peoples of the world, we pray. Sustain the efforts of those who pursue justice and equity for all. Defend and accomplish and accompany all immigrants and refugees and all who are persecuted for their ethnic origin or religious beliefs. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For Holy Cross Lutheran Church and its ministries, we pray. Prepare children, teachers, and youth ministry directors for a new year of learning. Embolden our witness to invite others to the table. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, we pray. Be present with those who live in isolation or fear, especially those who are incarcerated or detained. Comfort all who are sick or grieving. Merciful God, for what else do the people of God pray? For all these things spoken aloud and in our hearts, merciful God, for all the saints who confess God's name and give thanks, may we cling to the promise of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. We invite you to share that peace with those nearby.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. was always the guest. In the homes of Peter and Jairus, Mary and Martha, Joanna and Susanna, he was always the guest. At the meal tables of the wealthy, where he pled the case of the poor, he was always the guest, upsetting polite company, befriending isolated people, welcoming the stranger, he was always the guest. But here, at this table, he is the host. Those who wish to serve him must be first served by him. And those who want to follow him must be first fed by him. For this is the table where God intends us to be nourished. This is the table where we who are broken are made whole. So come all you who hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, for a better life, for a fairer world. Jesus Christ who has sat at our tables, now invites us to be guests at his. And so we remember how on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after the supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So now we do as Jesus did. We take this bread and wine, the produce of the earth, and the fruit of human labor. In these, Jesus has promised to be present. And through these, Christ can make us whole. We ask, merciful God, that you send in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle upon this bread and wine and fill them with the fullness of Jesus. And let that same Spirit rest upon us. Call us from the folly of this world until in wisdom we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to live and to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's presence there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet. Please be seated. The ushers are directed forward.
beloved of God. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, that all may come to know your love. Amen. Amen. Joyfully we sing, Earth and Old Star. book of Romans, the apostle reminds us of this promise, that neither death nor life, nor angels or rulers, things present or things to come, nor powers or heights or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So now, may the creator strengthen us, God the creator strengthen us, Jesus the beloved fill us, and the Holy Spirit the comforter keep us in that peace. Amen. Go in peace. Love your neighbor. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.